Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Our Saviors Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our Saviors is a congregation of people forgiven in Christ whose mission is to proclaim the good news and connect faith to everyday life. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us. Our traditional worship will begin in a few moments. Good morning, our saviors. Welcome to worship. We are glad that you're here with us today, but also we say welcome to those who join us by television and by Facebook. It's good to be together in Christian community. As we begin worship today, I want you to take notice of the envelopes that you maybe have already seen that are at the end of the pews. You can use these envelopes to contribute through Lutheran disaster response to the, uh, to the relief efforts in Hawaii following those devastating wildfires on Maui. Keep in mind, 100% of your gift will go to direct support of those who are trying to put their lives back together. You can place the envelopes in the offering plate during the offering or return them to the church office or do what I did last night and use your smartphone, scan the QR code and give directly to Lutheran Disaster Response that way. As we begin worship today, I invite you to stand as you are comfortable doing. We're going to begin by greeting one another in the peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Would you share a greeting with one another, please? Let's remain standing and join our voices together in singing in Christ there is no east or west. Welcome to worship in the name of our holy God who made sun, rain, and grain, our Savior Jesus who became healing bread, Holy Spirit who breathes life on us again. Amen.
Let's pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. We pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to go off script for just a bit this morning for a special announcement. Thursday. And it's interesting to me how things look so different at age 60 than they did at age 50. We seem to have entered a season of transition here at Our Saviors, and I've been doing a lot of praying and reflecting as a result. And I know many of you have as well. In that process, what I have discerned, along with the governing board, is that my call to serve as your senior pastor is nearing its completion. And I'm here today to announce that I will be retiring from ministry as of September 18th. My last day at Our Saviors will be Sunday, September 17th, which is in compliance with rules that are set forth by the South Dakota Synod. You know, in the 10 years that we have walked and worked together, God has been shaping us, stretching us, and sending us out as agents of grace into this broken world. As our paths will soon diverge, I want you all to know that I will cherish the relationships we have formed as we have stewarded the mission that God entrusted to us. And I will hold close to my heart this time that we have shared. To be truthful, I'm not sure what the next chapter holds for me. So I welcome and I covet your prayers, even as I promise to you to lift up our saviors in my prayers as you continue to strive ever forward as a church of substance that proclaims boldly the Christ in whom we believe and nurtures faith that connects with everyday life. Peace be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Randy. Uh, as president of our congregation here at Our Saviors, I wanted to take this moment uh, to provide some reflections on the news that Pastor Randy shared with us here this morning. I uh, was thinking a lot about this yesterday. I was driving home from Rapid City, uh, having gone there for another soccer trip with my son. Uh, and I've gone on a lot of soccer trips over many weekends and many drives home. And I often find myself, especially when I'm with myself and just my kid, usually sleeping in the back seat, as I'm taking that drive home, finding uh, myself in an emotional place where I feel both melancholy and nostalgia. And that kind of soft sadness that intermixes with a longing and appreciation for the moments that we've had together in the past. I think we all feel that way often in life. I think especially this time of year, as many people are bringing their children to college for the first time and dropping them off, um, or taking their uh, young kid to their first day at kindergarten. We have these mixed emotions uh, about the things and the moments that we have in our life and, and an appreciation for what they are. And in many ways, that's how I feel about this news that Pastor Randy has shared. I think um, we all, need to really take time to appreciate the things that you have done for us. You have served us with an open heart and with full passion for this congregation. 
You have made us better people. You have given us a stronger and deeper faith. Um, and it's, that is something that we will always appreciate and um, have a great deal of gratitude for. And I know we will have an opportunity to celebrate your service to our saviors on September 17th. Um, and, and we'll talk about what that road looks like going forward. But at this moment and at this time, we just want to extend our appreciation and gratitude to you for your 10 plus years of service here with our saviors. So what do we do with those feelings, this sudden change in the path going forward? When we're in worship, it's good to go back to where it all begins, to the promise that's given to us through the waters of baptism. And so we join our voices together in giving thanks for that gift that God gives to us through these holy waters. The chaos in this world is up to my neck. The storm rages over my head. We cannot keep our feet, for the waves hit the boat. And where, you, where are you, O oh God? Yet we remember you were there when the disciples floundered on the stormy sea. They thought you did not care, but you were simply not afraid. With your word, our storms could quiet and calm. With some faith, we could walk on the waves. Jesus, baptize us into life. Make us unafraid of the rain. We live today because of you. We are saved when we call upon your name. Our beginning in our time. 
God speaks to us in scripture, preaching, song, and prayer. A reading from Romans. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected God's people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected the people whom God foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that God may be merciful to all. Word of God, word of life. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, if you're looking for a rough day to be a follower of Jesus, you have found it. The day that starts out the way you expect then takes a sudden turn. You're left trying to understand some new piece of information about the leader you've come to know quite well. And I'm not just talking about the news we received from Pastor Randy today about his retirement. We'll get to that. I want to wait for him to come back so I can talk to him first. I'm also talking about the day we heard in today's gospel from a chapter that starts out like many others in Jesus' ministry. Just, it starts with just a little tango between Jesus and some religious leaders all pretty normal stuff for Jesus, but then Jesus leaves town and he goes northwest to Tyre and Sidon, these two non-Jewish towns, and he meets there this Canaanite woman. And by then, something seems off with Jesus. For one reason or another, Jesus isn't acting like the Jesus we normally expect. This isn't, let the children come to me, Jesus. This isn't Jesus talking openly with the stranger, with the stranger woman at the well, or patient Jesus who heals and welcomes all. This is, wait, what is this? Is this crabby, cranky Jesus? Jesus showing signs of burnout? Is this hangry Jesus? Could, could this be insensitive racial stereotyping Jesus? Whatever it is, Jesus acts so unusually in this passage that even professional biblical commentators do not know what to make of it. Richard Ward, a professor emeritus of homiletics and worship, notes Jesus' brusque dismissal of the woman, says that Jesus gives the woman the silent treatment. Ward says he insults her, and this insult amounts to ritualized humiliation. Marilyn Salmon, New Testament scholar, writes, quite frankly, Jesus does not come off well in this encounter with the Canaanite woman. 
When seeking who models the most admirable behavior in this encounter, Salman concludes it's the Canaanite woman, not Jesus. The Canaanite woman models persistence and faith, while in this one moment, Jesus mirrors the side of our humanity where we define and fear another on the basis of skin color, nationality, class, or creed, these deeply ingrained stereotypes that go back generations. And widely respected Greek scholar James Boyce concludes something similar. He notes that many interpreters have have sought to soften or explain away the clear and direct language of the text. See, if you thought Jesus' behavior was kind of unusual here, you're just not alone. Well, at the risk of trying to save Jesus from some embarrassment, this morning I want to tell you I believe there is a reason Jesus speaks to the Canaanite woman like this, and it's not because he's having a bad day. This isn't warm and fuzzy, let the children come to me, Jesus, but I still think Jesus is acting consistent with the Jesus we actually recognize. He's having, not having a bad day. He's doing a thing. And to know what the thing is, I think we have to look at Paul's letters, like the one we read today that he writes to the church in Rome. You see, there's a thing that happens in certain letters from Paul. Paul says people are trapped in sin, and the only person who can free them is Jesus. Paul cycles through metaphors, but the message is pretty consistent. So in Galatians, Paul describes describes sin as slavery. We cannot fulfill God's commandments, so we're enslaved to sin, and the slavery leads to death. But true freedom comes to us through Christ alone. In 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the language of family, adoption, and inheritance. The earthly reality we share, it just can't inherit the kingdom of God, but we are God's adopted children, so we can live again through new life in Christ. And then there's the bit we read today from Romans, where Paul writes, we are disobedient to God, but this very disobedience has set the stage for God's mercy. God has imprisoned all of us in disobedience so that God can be merciful to all. And across his letters, Paul uses this kind of universalizing language about the power of sin. We're trapped in sin. Its power is absolute. Only once we recognize this absolute power can we discover the somehow still greater love of God, love so overwhelming it can overcome every human absolute. Granted, the way Paul talks about this, still kind of abstract. So we have to ask, what does this actually look like? What does it feel like to be imprisoned in disobedience? Well, It means quite simply that every time we try to get close to God or to each other or even closer to ourselves, there's something that stands in the way. Jesus tells us we can summarize all God's commandments with love. Love God above all, love others as we love ourselves. But anything that stands in the way of that love, it shows how we live in disobedience. And and this is the pattern. We reach out to others to love them, but something stands in the way. Someone tries to love us, but man, we keep them at a distance, or we reach out to God, and God seems so far away. And this is the story from the gospel. This is a whole story about a woman just trying to cross every divide to get closer to God, but she can't. And the story shows this gulf between her and God is just uncrossable, and only once This is totally established. Does Jesus cross the divide? So I want to retell the story so you can see this at work. Their encounter begins with physical distance. The woman lives in this region, Tyre and Sidon, up northwest, and this is not where Jesus is from. Jesus goes to that place. She comes out to see him. See how the physical distance is closing? They close just a little bit of the distance. They keep them apart, but there's still more. She comes to him shouting, shouting, Has anyone ever yelled at you on the street? But Jesus is entirely silent. And the silent treatment is another kind of distance. Then there's the distance created by Jesus' own followers. Before Jesus can break his silence, the disciples sweep in and ask Jesus to send the the woman away. And, and this one really gets me because the woman's child is in trouble. Like, this little girl is possessed by a demon, and when her mom tries to close the distance, you know, like, those disciples should, like, bring her to Jesus, but they don't. Why? Because they're annoyed. Oh, man, that gets me. They have so little compassion that they will send away a distressed mom fighting for her daughter because she's annoying. Not a good look, Right? 
So we've got physical distance, godly silence, annoyed, dismissive disciples, but the woman is not deterred. There's still a few things she can try, so she kneels at Jesus' feet as though he's royalty, and she didn't start this way. This is a tactic. Remember, she starts with the shouting. <laughs> the shouting didn't work, so maybe if she's humble and mild, Jesus will give her what she wants. But you see what this does? Man, just by acknowledging Jesus' power, by citing his privilege and her disadvantage, she separates herself even further from Jesus. And, and now this is the part of the story where we want Jesus. We expect Jesus to just show her some compassion because this woman is begging him. She's literally placed himself at his feet. And every other place in the gospel where a woman kneels at Jesus' feet, she gets extreme compassion, but not here. This time, her behavior doesn't get the compassionate response. Instead, this is the moment Jesus says, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And, and now I will admit, this is where I got to get a little clever because a lot of commentators believe that Jesus is just speaking from the heart in this moment, just being vulnerable and talking nakedly to this woman, but I don't really think that's what's happening. I don't think he's saying what's on his mind. I don't think he's saying what he personally believes. Instead, I think he's telling this woman exactly what she expects to encounter in a social situation like this with a person like him, a man like him, an Israelite like him. When she kneels at his feet, she identifies this huge social distance between them. Jesus has all the power and privilege in his society, and she has none, and she puts this on display. And I think Jesus gives her this vicious response because that's exactly how these encounters go. Not because he believes it, but to name this huge social force, this worldview that dominates their society. It's like Jesus is saying, look, look at this woman. She's gotten physically closer. She pushed her way through all of you obstructing disciples. She figured out a way to get here. But at the end of the day, she can't change her identity. She can't change this racist society, at least not in time to save her daughter. She can't change our system where everything go, good go, belongs to some people and others just get the scraps. So when Jesus says, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, he is acknowledging this last uncrossable barrier. The fact that everything in their society keeps this woman in her place. Every social and cultural and political message just dehumanizes her and forces her to sacrifice her dignity for one chance to save her child. And Jesus is saying, do you see this? What would be fair is for this woman to get a shot. What would be fair is for Jesus to listen to her and heal her kid because nobody else will. And Jesus knows this world is not fair to her, and it never will be. In fact, what Jesus names is that by the standards of the world, again, what is unfair is the fact that this woman would even dare come to Jesus and ask for help. What right does she have to demand something of Jesus? It is not fair for her to demand food from his table. She should get that help from somewhere else. But there is nowhere else, and that's Jesus' point. He has to make it abundantly clear that this world is so trapped in disobedience that this woman has no chance for a fair shake. Not even when God comes to her town. Because at the end of the day, society sees it like this. She's a Canaanite woman, Jesus is still a relatively privileged pastor dude, and in a society like theirs, that is not a divide you can cross. Jesus shows them their world is so entirely imprisoned in disobedience that even the most basic notions of fairness are perverted. I don't know why Jesus chooses this woman and this moment to demonstrate this, but he does. And there's just something about that circumstance that makes it the right moment for Jesus to name this huge social force that controls their world. But notice, the second that dynamic is clear, once everyone knows this situation is totally untenable and this woman is essentially helpless, that's when he heals her daughter. And he does it instantly, as though all the divides simply ceased to exist. Sometimes we need Jesus to take a break from being so warm and fuzzy because otherwise we might forget that this world is entirely trapped in disobedience. We might actually believe that we could do something to change this place. 
Instead, occasionally we need to set aside every degree of false optimism to be quite realistic about the world and to remember what it looks like and feels like to be imprisoned in disobedience, to truthfully name just how often we are unable to cross the distance between ourselves and God, between ourselves and the ones we love. You know what this feels like. Think of how many people you love who feel far away. Don't you wish you could get closer to them again? Consider the people you love who remain distant because of some old fight. Do you truly know how to cross that divide? In the gospel, Jesus' silent treatment shocks us, but what about your own unanswered prayers? Man, have you ever shouted loudly enough to get God to give up the silent treatment? This gospel story centers around an offstage suffering child. Well, think of our children who suffer in this society. Have we ever taken effective steps to eliminate their hunger or ensure all of them are properly clothed or prevent another school shooting? Think of our church. In our listening post last month, you folks shared how often you felt separated from the work of God in this place. You want to hear, no, you want to hear and know more about what God is doing here. And I can't blame you. To be sure, the leadership of our church could do better at communication. We know this. We're working on it. And that's why, from our perspective, it's a little demoralizing to actually receive complaints about stuff we have bent over backwards to communicate. Like, we're just looking at each other across the divide. You want communication. We're trying to communicate. But we try to draw closer to each other, and something stands in the way. And here he is. Randy, this is my experience of you too, man. You have boldly tried to lead us in the direction of God's voice, but this is a world trapped in disobedience, and something has always stood in the way of that calling. Something always will. When you started here at the church, we faced immense trouble with the budget, staff cuts, lots of stress, whole thing, you let us through that. Then you had to hire me. Church hasn't recovered from that yet. (laughs) Massive governance change. Then we lost the pastor of youth and family. Then the pandemic. Then George Floyd. Then you got through two bishop elections. Thanks for sticking around. Then the death of two employees, You guys, none of us in our professional careers have even had to deal with the death of one. Staff transitions. A whole school moves in. You got your own health issues. You got your your bum knee, your bum arm, your other bum stuff. Randy, I have never in my entire life met someone who so consistently tried to close the gap between himself and God, but I have seen all those obstacles in the way. And even when it comes to those social forces we read about in today's gospel, privilege and prejudice, you just do what Jesus does. You call out the sinful dynamic. You put your finger on the uncrossable divide. But man, brother, how the followers of Jesus get annoyed every time they hear about another Canaanite woman. Like, I have read all those letters you receive. The fact is, Randy, I know you know this church, you got to hear it too. Neither you nor me nor any of us can change this rotten, ridiculous world because we are imprisoned in a world of disobedience. And Jesus wants to free us. Jesus is ready. But we first need to acknowledge that for all our efforts, there are things in this world we simply cannot repair, divides we cannot cross. And that means the only thing left to us, to any of us from old Canaanite women to St. Paul writing his letters of the churches to privileged old crusty white dude pastors like him and me and the other guy with the bigger beard. The only hope any of us have is to put our faith in Jesus. That's it. Because Jesus alone is the one who is powerful enough to break this prison of disobedience. Jesus alone can break God's silence. Jesus alone is patient enough to deal with disciples who have struck God's love. Jesus alone can heal the people this world ignores. And if we want that healing, we got to lean on Jesus like we actually know the true power of this world. And the Canaanite woman shows us how. Because when she is faced, with the insurmountable power of the world, with every crossable divide, she just gives the power back to Jesus. And she does it with one little prayer. And that little prayer is the best hope for the Christian who is trapped in this disobedient world. That prayer is just, help me, Jesus. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) And today... As we acknowledge the absolute power of sin in this world, the divides that separate us, we want to give our power back to Jesus with this same prayer. 
Today I want to say it as a group. Help us, Jesus. And I want to say a line as I finish today so you can follow with that prayer. You ready? God, when you feel so far away, help us, Jesus. When we leave our loved ones to fight with them, help us, Jesus. When otherwise good people will stand in our way, help us, Jesus. When you, God, are so quiet, help us, Jesus. When I beg and it is not enough, help us, Jesus. When I'm tracked by everything I've done wrong, help us, Jesus. When I fear the future's unknown path, help us, Jesus. When this world asks me to throw away my dignity, help us, Jesus. When we find ourselves annoyed by people we should love, help us, Jesus. When we need the money to do the mission, help us, Jesus. When we crash against the power of this world, help us, Jesus. When we have lost the will to fight, help us, Jesus. When we have lost all other hope, help us, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Amen. stand as you're able. The seed of God's word has fallen upon us once again today. So we rise now to proclaim together the faith that is taking root within us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God, who is merciful to all, receives our joys and our concerns, let us now pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of creation. O oh God, your spirit gathers the church. Shepherd those who are newly baptized and newly ordained. Breathe life into ecumenical and interfaith endeavors and support missionaries throughout the globe and our partners in ministry. You will not reject us. Lord, help us. The very earth you created and all of its inhabitants cry out to you for mercy in the wake of extreme weather and natural disaster. Teach us how to steward your good creation in a partnership that mirrors your love for all that you have made. Comfort the people of Maui and give them what they need to rise up from the ashes of destruction. You will not reject us. Lord, help us. You call leaders to bridge differences and practice generosity. So inspire all in authority to protect people in harm's way, deliver those in bondage, support fair elections, provide care for military personnel and veterans, and show mercy to those for whom they have responsibility. You will not reject us. Lord, help us. You provide for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Embrace people who have been rejected because of difference. Heal trauma caused by racism or prejudice. Shield any who are persecuted. Console Anthony Pizer and family as they mourn the death of his brother Benjamin Smith. And grant healing and hope to Larry Jacobson, James LeDuc, Dean Amdahl, Elsie Metz, John Lyne, Betty Tank, Phil Borgum, Jan Skorpik, and Harper Skajewski and her family. You will not reject us. Lord, help us. O oh God, you journey with us in all of life's transitions. Guide those preparing for baptism, marriage, and retirement. Guide this church's governing board and committees in their visioning and ministry especially in this season of change. Walk alongside staff as they prepare for fall programming. Safeguard those who travel. You will not reject us. Lord, help us. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to join me as we pray together before we receive our offering. God, you look at the world so filled with need and you tell us to feed them. But look at us and see just how little we have to give. We have nothing but this half-empty building. We have nothing but a few small children, nothing more than our tired old souls. But with five loaves and two fish, you fed a town full of hungry people in an otherwise deserted place. If you multiply the food, we will break the bread. Somehow in this nothing place, you will give us everything. Our offering is received. Children, you can come and help with this noisy offering.
Please pray with me. Jesus, you are here again to take every meager gift we bring. You will make it more than enough. Yes, you give us more than enough to feed your world, and we feel ready for the feast to begin. Amen. I invite you to stand once again. Jesus, we feel so hungry in our spirits, thirsty in our souls. You fill our plate with wisdom. You pour a glass to the top of your grace. And we know this is true because we remember the night you were betrayed. The night when you took bread from the table, blessed it, gave thanks for it, broke it, so that there would be enough for everyone, and then gave it to the disciples. And you said, take and eat, this is my body, and I'm giving it to you. Do this so that you will remember me. And then after supper, you took the cup once again, and raising it high, you blessed it and gave thanks for it, and then gave it for all of them to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this so that you will remember me. This same Jesus who feeds us has taught us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This food is on the table. We will soon taste our relief. Now we set down our sins to take the morsel that forgives and we eat to feel joyful again. You may be seated.
Once again, that's pretty good. God, thank you for the food that satisfies our hungry souls. Now send us with armfuls of life to share with the hungry who were not here. Amen. It's been good to worship together today, and I know our friends online or on the broadcast. Thank you for joining us in worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more information about Our Saviors, please visit our website at oslchurch.com and like us on Facebook. We invite you to join us again next Sunday morning. Until next time, may God's abundant love and blessings empower you to share the good news of Jesus Christ.